This is the new 2021 Volkswagen ID4, and it's the latest electric crossover. It has a 250 mile range. It starts around $40,000, and Volkswagen wants you to think of it as the fully electric alternative to the Honda CRV and Toyota RAV4. And today, I'm going to review it. Before I get started, be sure to check out Cars and Bids, which is my enthusiast car auction website for cool cars from the modern era. We've had some amazing sales recently, especially with Tesla's Model 3, Model S, Model X. We have sold them all. Over a dozen Teslas have come to Cars and Bids. They get good money, lots of interest, lots of bids. So if you're looking for a great place to sell your Tesla, Cars and Bids is the place. And if you're looking for a cool place to buy a Tesla or any other enthusiast car from the modern era, check out Cars and Bids with daily auctions of cool cars from the 1980s and up. But back to the ID4. First, a little overview. The ID4 starts around $41,000 with shipping, but that's before any government incentives, which could bring the total that you pay down to the low to mid $30,000 range, depending on where you live. And that makes the ID4 pretty comparable to similarly equipped versions of the Toyota RAV4 and Honda CRV. The ID4 is offered in two configurations. Rear wheel drive, like this car, starts around $41,000 with shipping, and it has about two. 200 horsepower. Or you can upgrade to all-wheel drive. You get four drive wheels, of course, and you'll also get a big horsepower bump to around 300 horses. All-wheel drive models will start around $45,000 with shipping. Now, range is about 250 miles, and as for styling, you can see it doesn't look like any other Volkswagen model you're familiar with. And it's not just the styling. The ID4 offers a lot of weird quirks and features compared to any other Volkswagen you know. And today, I'm going to show you all of them. First, I'll take you on a tour of the ID4 and show you all of those quirks and features. Then I'm going to get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'll give it a Doug score. All right, I'm going to start the quirks and features of the ID4 with getting in, and that means starting with the key, which looks sort of like a regular Volkswagen key, but more futuristic. You can see it's shiny black, and it doesn't have traditional key buttons. Instead, just sort of general areas where you press stuff, turn it over, and you have the Volkswagen logo. It looks nice. Now, from there, you unlock the doors, and you can see the door handle here is flush with the side of the car, and it opens a little bit differently than you might think. You reach your hand in here, and you don't pull the door handle up. Instead, there's an electronic popper. You just pop it open and then the door opens up. Take another look. You just sort of pop and the door opens. No handle that you lift like a traditional door. But anyway, you climb inside the ID4. One of the very first things you notice is the white accents directly in front of the driver's seat. You have a white steering wheel, but more interestingly, a white turn signal stock and a white wiper stock. I'm not sure I've ever seen those items in white before, but unquestionably the strangest white item here is the gear selector, which is mounted here sort of to the upper right of the steering wheel. And it works in kind of an odd way. In order to put the car in drive, you push it forward, and then you're in drive. In order to put it in reverse, you pull it backwards, and then it goes into reverse, you can see. And neutral is sort of a half turn in either direction, and then that will send the car into neutral. Definitely an odd gear selector for a rather odd vehicle. Now, if you want to put it into park, you can just climb out of the car when it's stopped, and it will automatically switch into park. But if you want to do it yourself, there is a button at the end of the gear lever that puts it in park, puts on the parking brake, and that way you can get out and not think about it. Now, one interesting thing with starting this car, that gear lever is pretty much all you have to do. You climb inside, put your foot on the brake, the car recognizes you're there, and then you just shift into drive. You don't have to use a start button. It just knows you want to go, and then you can go. And when you're done, you just climb out and walk away, and it turns itself off. There's no start button necessary, although there is actually a start button on the side of the steering column, like where you'd stick a key in just in case you'd prefer to press the button yourself, but you don't have to in the ID4. And by the way, with the gear lever, one interesting item next to drive D, there's also a mode marked B, which stands for braking, and that turns on this car's one pedal driving. If you've driven other electric cars, you know you can drive them with one pedal. You press the accelerator, they go, you get off the accelerator, and they slow down. That is not true of this car when you're in drive. Volkswagen is aiming the ID4 more at traditional crossover.
crossover buyers who don't have much EV experience, and so they wanted it to coast like a normal car when you get off the accelerator. But if you do want that one pedal driving, you can switch it into B mode for braking, and then that will come on, and you have more of a one pedal feel. But anyway, beyond the strange gear lever, the weirdness in this car is just getting started. Let's talk about the pedals for a second. You look at them and you can see the brake pedal is a pause button, and the accelerator is a play button. This is only on the first edition ID4 models, but it is an interesting and certainly quirky little feature. And how about the window switches? Go over to the driver's door panel, you can see there are only two window switches. So does that mean you can only roll up and down the front windows? No, no. If you want to adjust the back windows, press this button marked rear, and then those same window switches are now controlling the rear windows. And if you want to do the fronts again, press rear, you turn it off, and then you're controlling the front windows again. So only two window switches for four windows, thanks to that rear button. Kind of an odd way to do it. And we are nowhere near done with the strange controls in this car. There is a giant panoramic sunroof in here. It doesn't open, but it does have a sunshade you can open or close. And to do that, you have this little control the ceiling next to the mirror in the usual spot, but it's strange. You slide your finger and that will open the sunshade. You slide it back and you can see the sunshade opens right up. You slide your finger in the other direction and that closes the sunshade. So you don't have a traditional button or switch to open or close this. Instead, you have this slidey thing where the button would be an odd control. And more odd controls in this car. How about changing the climate temperature? You don't have a button or a dial. Instead, you have this little touchpad area, red and blue, and you tap, 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 tap to increase your temperature or decrease your temperature. Just tap and tap. Same deal with volume, unfortunately, for the radio. You can see the volume control also in the same place, also a little touchpad. And again, you have to tap, 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 tap to increase the volume and tap, tap, tap to decrease the volume. One hidden trick here, though, is you can adjust the climate control or the volume by sliding your finger. So you don't have to do so many taps. You can slide your finger across the pad and increase volume or climate control, which makes this easier to use and kind of cool. And next up, since we're in this vicinity, let's talk infotainment. You have this large touchscreen in the center. The ID4 comes standard with a 10 inch touchscreen. This is the larger 12 inch touchscreen, and it looks very nice in the center of this interior. And it has this cool feature where it recognizes your approaching hand. You can see as my hand moves closer, more information appears on the screen because it sees me approaching. So I'm about to tap it, and then it tells me more stuff. When I go away, put my hand away for a few seconds, the information kind of decreases increases to make the screen less cluttered. That is a cool touch. Unfortunately, the rest of the infotainment system, not really all that cool. In fact, frankly, this infotainment system is a bit of a disaster. You can see the biggest problem is responsiveness. It just doesn't respond. You move your finger around and it doesn't really do anything with any level of speed or quickness or urgency. And that's true basically everywhere you go in this infotainment system. It is not responsive at all and it is a big disappointment. Frankly, this system is not ready for prime time with this level of slowness to respond to your touch. And you sit in a Tesla or basically any other modern car and they're far, far more responsive infotainment screens than this. This is like 2007 stuff, not 2021. The responsiveness of this screen is a big disappointment. And frankly, that's actually kind of a shame because the infotainment system itself is actually pretty good. It's well laid out. It's very intuitive and logical. If only it would respond to your inputs. You have a little home button over on the left, this blue square, and you tap that to go to your home screen. And you have several different home screen options that you could always be sitting on, one with your apps, and then a second one with your navigation map and your radio, and then there's a third one with some different settings that you can choose. And it's good. This is a good system. Logical, well laid out, easy to use, just not very responsive in any respect, and it is disappointing. If an update comes out to make this more responsive, I could see this being a pretty good infotainment screen, but right now it is far behind, way too laggy, not good. Although with that said, it's important to know there is a voice control system and you can just talk to it. You don't even have to press a button to wake it up. I will try now. Hello, ID. I'm cold. This function is currently not available. Okay, so that didn't work very well. That was one of the two commands that Volkswagen suggested I try. Now I'm gonna try the other one. Hello, ID. Tell me a joke. 
Oh, my developers didn't teach me that but I'll give it a go anyway, I couldn't work out how to fasten my seatbelt. Then it clicked. Okay, so the system can tell you a joke. A bad joke, it is a German car after all, but it can't do the other thing that Volkswagen told me to try to do with it. So maybe the voice control system isn't quite ready for prime time either. These are neat ideas if they worked, but in this car, I'm just not quite seeing it yet. Now, one other interesting thing about the voice control system, it sort of communicates with you using this light below the windshield. This is sort of in the driver's field of view. You can see when I wake it up, this light turns on to let you know that it's listening to you right now. And this light is used in various different ways to communicate with you. And some of the safety systems, it lets you know, like if you're getting too close to another car. And when you have the navigation system going, this light can light up left or right to tell you which direction you have to turn. So you have this sort of communication light at the base of the windshield. This is an interesting feature. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see it expanded in more vehicles in the future. But anyway, moving back to the infotainment, there are some cool features in here when you do get it to respond. For instance, you can select the ambient lighting color and you can choose a custom color. And there are two separate colors. You can choose like an upper color and a lower color in the interior. Or you can just choose a mood if you want to select a specific mood you're in. The ambient lighting will go into the color that it thinks matches that mood. I also absolutely love how you turn on and off the safety assist in this car. You press this little assist button below the screen and then it pops up this image of a car on a road with cars around it. And each item in this image you tap to turn on or off various safety features. So you tap the car next to you and that turns on or off lane change assist. You tap the car in front of you and that turns on or off adaptive cruise control. You tap the lane lines and that turns on or off lane keeping assist. This is a really cool way to do it instead of just a boring like list menu, you have an actual little picture here and that's neat. Another neat item in this infotainment system is adjusting the climate control. You press this button with a snowflake on it marked Clima. Not climate, strangely, but clima. Anyway, you press that and you can adjust all the climate controls or you can go over to smart climate and tell it what you need. For instance, warm up my hands or clear the windshield and it will do whatever is necessary to make those things happen. Warm my feet and that way you don't have to manually like adjust where you want the airflow, the temperature. It will do it all for you. That is a pretty cool trick and I like that idea. It's neat to see. With that said, some more drawbacks to this infotainment system. Two climate control items I really don't like one is heated seats. I always want heated seats to be a simple button. You just tap to turn them on. You don't have to go into some menu to find your heated seats. Well, in this car, you can see on the infotainment screen, there are the heated seats. You just tap them to turn them on, except that's not true. Those are fake buttons. You tap it and then it pulls up the climate control menu and then you have to tap the heated seat control again. And that is just really bad design. It's annoying you can press a heated seat button, but it's not actually a heated seat button. Maybe even worse is what happens if you want to turn on the climate control when it's off. You would think you can just start adjusting the temperature but that does nothing. Instead, to turn on the climate control, you have to press clima, go into the climate control menu, and then you can adjust the temperature, except that still does nothing, and the fan speed does nothing. You actually have to turn it on first before you can do those things, unlike every other climate control system where you start adjusting stuff and it just turns on automatically. It's just annoying to make this a multi-step process. And interestingly, speaking of climate, you have some climate controls to the left of the steering wheel on this little pad shared with the headlights. You have your windshield defogger on here and your rear windshield window defogger as well. So you can just turn those on with the push of a button without having to go into the climate control screen. And next up, moving on from the center infotainment screen, there is a second screen in here, and that would be the one for your gauge cluster. It's about five and a half inches. You can see it's directly in front of the steering wheel. This one is a lot better than the screen in the middle. For one thing, it moves with the steering column. So if you adjust the column up or down, this screen is placed exactly where you want it, and it's always visible, which is nice to see. But in addition to that, it also provides an easy, clean, simple, readout of your most important information and this little picture over on the left this shows you like where you are on the road like if it's currently seeing the lane lines so the assist systems are working if it's seeing a car in front of you it tells you how far away that car is which helps you with your adaptive cruise control following distance and that picture is sort of always there just letting you know the current situation with the assist features and you can make it bigger if you want you tap this little button on the steering wheel marked view and that enlarges this image or you can press it again and the image becomes smaller 
controller. By the way, worth noting, the assist features in this car are pretty comprehensive and nearly all of them are standard. Come standard with adaptive cruise control, lane keep assist, and a lot of other driver assistant features you don't always see in crossovers this size and price point. But back to the steering wheel, I wanna talk steering wheel controls. You have controls on the steering wheel, but they're not buttons. Instead, they're like little electronic pads that give haptic feedback. You use this to adjust your stereo volume or various other different items. Your steering wheel controls, a little bit different from normal, but they work pretty well, very easy to figure out. Now also with the steering wheel, you can see at the very bottom it says first, which seems kind of odd since this is the Volkswagen ID4. What exactly does first mean? Well, like I said earlier, this is a first edition model of this car. The very earliest ones will be the first editions, and that's celebrated with this little steering wheel badge. Badging is actually an interesting thing in this car. There are some unusual ones. For instance, on the seats you have ID period printed into the seats. Volkswagen is trying to make ID be like a sub-brand of Volkswagen for their electric vehicles, and so there's a lot of ID branding on this car. Now on the front fender you have another badge that says first, which is interesting. A lot of people are going to be confused by that, but it's for the first editions of this car. On the B pillar you have a very subtle Volkswagen badge. It's like black on black. You don't really see it unless you're close to the car, but it's there to emphasize its Volkswagen-ness. Probably my favorite badge in this car is on the back. The ID4 badge is white and it looks futuristic and cool right in the center of the tailgate. I like that. The Volkswagen badge back there is also white, which is unusual. Obviously, other Volkswagens, it's silver, chrome. Not in this one. A futuristic white badge for a futuristic car. Now, the white badge is also continued up front. You can see the white Volkswagen logo up here. In most ID4s, this front logo and the whole grille area will light up when you're driving along, but not in the first edition models. Instead, it's just white. It doesn't light up in these, but most other ID4s will have a light up front badge and grill situation. But anyway, I don't want to talk too much about the exterior of this car before I get into the back seat, because I know a lot of crossover shoppers are going to be interested in how this back seat feels and how roomy it is. And I have to say, it's pretty roomy back here. I'm actually surprised. I can sit back here as a rather tall adult. My legs have no problem behind the front seat. My head has no problem with the ceiling. This is a roomy back seat. I looked at the numbers and this is pretty comparable to the RAV4 and the CRV on paper. But to me back here, it feels bigger than those cars. And I think you could comfortably seat adults in the back, which isn't always true of crossovers at this size. Now, as for quirks and features back here, there aren't really any unusual ones except the storage pockets the back of the front seat. You have one on top for small items, and then you have a second storage pocket on the bottom for larger items. Two different storage pockets on both front seats for four total storage pockets. You also have two chargers back here, USB-C, to charge your devices in back, and you have two climate control vents back here, although worth noting, no surprise, there isn't climate controls for the back seat. You don't really see that in crossovers at this price point, but worth pointing out. Also worth noting, folding down the back seat, pretty easy. There's just a little latch next to the headrest like in most cars. You just pull it, the back seat goes down, folds flat, and that's all you got to do. Very simple. And next up, moving around to the back of the ID4, you can see this giant light bar going across the whole rear, as is the new style trend these days. But if you look closely, you can see inside this light bar, there's like a plastic strip with little diamonds on it. They start small in the middle, and then they get larger as they go off to the side, all these little diamonds. Interestingly, that motif is also continued in the front grille. You have diamonds pretty much everywhere. Volkswagen has that front and rear in this car, sort of a little diamond theme, I guess. But anyway, you get back here, you open up the tailgate, and you can see the cargo area is actually also pretty big. Again, for a compact crossover RAV4 CRV size, this has a pretty large cargo area where you can put a lot of stuff. No way to fold down the rear seats from back here, unfortunately. No power operation, but there's not even a latch. You have to go around to the back seat like I just showed you if you want to put them down. But anyway, next up, moving on to the front of the ID4. Now, like I mentioned, most ID4 models will have a light up Volkswagen badge, but not the first edition like this. But there are still some interesting lighting items up here. For one thing, you can see there's a little light within the headlight housing that looks like an eyeball. It has little diamonds on the side of it. <laughs> it's sort of flared out on the sides and it looks rather interesting and unusual. I like to see that in there, kind of a strange little lighting quirk. Another one is the turn signal. You can see right now the car is operating with its running lights on, but when you go to put on the turn signal, the signal replaces the entire running light and it sort of goes around the entire headlight housing lighting up and blinking, which is a rather large and unusual turn signal. Also worth noting, you have another light in the grill here. So the Volkswagen badge doesn't light up, but these little light strips on the side of it do, sort of to accentuate the center 
driver of this car. So not only do you have a rear light bar, but you also have a front light bar in here, which is also starting to become common with a few cars. And I wonder if that trend will also catch on in the car business. Next up, since I'm out here, let's talk styling for a second. I wouldn't call this car weird, but I would certainly say it's distinctive from other Volkswagen models. The Tiguan, the Atlas, Volkswagen's other crossovers, this doesn't really look like them. It's lower, it sort of feels flatter, and it's more futuristic and modern. It has this two-tone situation with the contrasting color roof and the silver trim going across the window area. It's just a different type of Volkswagen crossover or SUV from the ones that you're used to. Now, one interesting thing with the ID4 is the overall design of this car is not that typical teardrop fastback shape like other electric cars. You can see the Model Y sort of curves down in the back. Same deal with the Mustang Mach-E curves down in the back for that fastback shape. Volkswagen told me this was very intentional. They didn't do this. They wanted to preserve cargo space in the back. And so they wanted to keep the roof line relatively flat and make it look like a more traditional crossover rather than give it that teardrop shape so they could get more space and more headroom in the rear. And finally, we're going to move up to the front of the ID4. Usually in electric car reviews, this is where I reveal a second hidden storage compartment, but not this time. The ID4 actually has like a mechanical situation up front, like a gas engine to car would have. It has all this stuff up here. So there's no storage compartment up here like in most other EVs. But talking about mechanical stuff, worth noting, like I said, this car has about 200 horsepower. This is the two wheel drive version, but an all wheel drive version is coming soon in the next few months that will have 300 horsepower and obviously all wheel drive. And that should be pretty potent actually. But anyway, speaking of this stuff, maybe wondering about the comparison between the ID4 and the gold standard Tesla. The closest Tesla competitor to this car would be the Model Y, which is Tesla's small crossover. And frankly, it's pretty similar. It also starts around $41,000 and it also has about 250 miles of range in its base level version. This is the same, 41 grand for 250 miles of range. They're pretty similar actually. Now, Tesla range increases dramatically when you get the all wheel drive version. And I'm not sure what's gonna happen with the ID4, if the all wheel drive will also increase range. I would assume so, but I guess we'll find out soon enough. But for now, base model for base model, the ID4 and the Model Y are pretty comparable in terms of pricing and range. And so those are the quirks and features of the 2021 Volkswagen ID4. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the ID4. And I have to say this vehicle is interesting in a really good way. A couple of months ago, I reviewed the Mach-E and I said it was the first really credible competitor to Tesla that was just as good in a lot of ways, better in some, a little worse in some, but like really credible. This car is the second that I've been in. Couple reasons why. Number one, very well built. Everything in here is very nice and it seems, there's some interesting stuff, some futuristic stuff. It doesn't seem like a legacy traditional car. And that's cool. Like that's what people are looking for in their electric vehicles. But I think the biggest benefits are most obvious on paper. You know, like I said, this thing is about Model Y spec when you look at price and range. 250 miles of range, about $41,000. That's about where the Model Y is. And if you apply this federal EV tax credit that Volkswagen still qualifies for, it's interesting. I mean, this does get into like the mid thirties, which is about RAV4 territory. And one thing that Volkswagen told me that I was surprised about there, obviously this is a competitor to Model Y, but they're more trying to get people who are looking at gas powered crossovers to switch to an electric car. And so that's one of the reasons why this is a little bit less EV ish and more kind of normal car-ish with like the coast feature instead of one pedal driving um, and with no maybe front trunk and you know with the interior packaging the styling the way it is with no teardrop shape they're all kind of intended to go after people who are not as ev focused but maybe you're just coming out of a regular crossover and don't want to take such a big leap to get into a teardrop shaped car with one pedal driving well this is that so how does it drive well pretty well actually surprisingly well i've driven model y this is excellent it's quiet in here it's comfortable it's roomy. I'm stunned at how roomy it is, front, back, and cargo area. Let me address the biggest drawback, which I already brought up, which is the infotainment system. You know, it's weird. The infotainment is inconsistent in this car. If you're in some screens, you go to move stuff and it's just fine. But here I'm scrolling and it just gets caught up and it takes forever to do something. It's a weird mix. The problem is that 
Tesla is always brilliant. Their screen is just fantastic, incredibly responsive. And frankly, that's true with most other automakers now. Most other automaker screens are just easy, good. You don't have to make any compromise. And this one has, has a few issues. And I hope that if they refine this screen just a little bit, <laughs> this car has some real serious benefits. Now, I want to accelerate here for a sec. It accelerates. It's not fast um, by any stretch. I, I feel like the base Model Y is probably quicker. Um, it's it's fine. Um, but important to remember, this is the two-wheel drive model with only 200 horsepower. 200 horsepower is just not that big of a number for a vehicle this size. It just isn't. Even RAV4, CRV, and stuff, I think, are all probably over 200 horsepower at this point. What I'm excited for, especially about ID4, is the all-wheel drive version, which is going to be 300 horsepower and only about five grand more expensive, like 4,400. So not only does it add all-wheel drive, but it also adds another 100 horsepower. And I think they told me it has like a heated windshield and it has a couple other little things. But the horsepower will be big. And if that also adds range, then you're really talking. Then you have a vehicle that, you know, all-wheel drive, faster, better range, and not that much more expensive. And I think that's where the sweet spot for this car will be. I'm up at a stoplight here next to a Model Y. In California, you're always at a stoplight next to a Model Y. And I have to say, I do like how this car looks better than the Y, and just generally better than the teardrop-shaped electric cars. One of the things that I dislike about the electric vehicles generally is most of them have this teardrop shape, which I've never really liked, especially in SUVs, because it really does cut down on your cargo room. And I know they do that for aero, and it really improves their range. Um, and so for Volkswagen to decide to have sort of a flatter roof, to have a more traditional crossover look and appeal to those more traditional crossover buyers they're giving up range to do that um, but you know there's a there's a trade-off there I think their thought is that it's it's gonna bring in more people and I think that that's probably true Volkswagen told me the vast majority of small crossover owners are driving 60 miles a day or less and so differences in range of 10 20 15 miles it doesn't matter as much as maybe having the car look how you'd expect. This is a great effort, and I think we are finally, finally seeing the first group of electric vehicles that really competes strongly against Tesla. This, the Mach-E, these are real serious shots at Tesla, and I think they're gonna do reasonably well. And so that's the Volkswagen ID4. This is an interesting crossover and has some good things going for it, like relatively affordable pricing, decent range, and good technology and styling. This is a strong challenger to Tesla, and I think this could be a popular crossover for shoppers looking to go electric. Anyway, now it's time to give the ID4 a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the ID4 is fine, not particularly beautiful, not ugly, and it gets a 5 out of 10. Acceleration does 0 to 60 in around 8 seconds, and it gets a 1 out of 10. Handling is normal for a little crossover, but not excellent, and it gets a 3 out of 10. Fun factor is relatively low. It's fun in that it's an interesting, quirky electric car, but it's not especially engaging to drive, and it gets a 2 out of 10. Cool factor is decent. It's just a crossover, but it's cooler than that given the styling, the electric component, and the design, and it gets a 4 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 15 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories and features, the ID4 is well equipped and it gets an 8 out of 10. Comfort is normal for a vehicle like this and it gets a 6 out of 10. Quality is only okay. Frankly, the interior materials are nice and most of the quality is quite good, but the lag time on that infotainment screen is a bit worrisome and it gets only a 6 out of 10. Practicality is good and it gets an 8 out of 10. Finally, value, and it's a nice one. Given the range, performance, price point, and equipment, it's a compelling value and it gets a 7 out of 10 for a total daily score of 35 out of 50. Added up and the Doug score is 50 out of 100, which places the ID4 here against relevant cars. It loses out to Tesla big, but keep in mind the Model Y performance I reviewed isn't really a competitor to the ID4. The Model Y is way more money and way more fun. Volkswagen swears the ID4 is more of a direct competitor to typical small crossovers like the RAV4 and Ford Escape. And in that sense, well, you see the results. It's better in the weekend scores as it's more fun and cooler, and about the same in the daily scores. The ID4 is indeed a good alternative to gas powered small crossovers, something of a stepping stone between a RAV4 and a Model Y. Why?